So I'm Talia Chan, and I'm doing a PhD in Theoretical Systems Biology at Imperial College in London. Um, and I'm funded by the uh, Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council in the UK. Um, so in my group, we've started adopting Julia more and more. Um, and in this talk, I really want to give you, uh, will tell you a story um, about how Julia is having a real impact on our research. Um, I won't go too far into the biological details or the mathematical details, but um, I hope at the end of this talk, you'll appreciate how um, the simple syntax and speed of Julia really are more than just conveniences to us. Um, they are actually enabling us to develop new methods. So I'll walk you through um, the general problem of uh, uh, inferring biological networks, uh, introduce you to a few of the uh, state-of-the-art data sets that we're seeing these days. Um, I'll tell you about uh, uh, the information measures package that we developed um, and how this helped us make a new algorithm. So uh, these pictures show how diverse the cells within a single organism can be. On the left, we have blood cells, and on the right, we have brain cells. And um, these, these are from one organism. And that organism would have started out as one single cell, uh, which divided and divided, produced more and more cells, all with identical genetic information. So how do these cells end up so different? Well, the answer is uh, the cells uh, interpret the genetic information in a very dynamic and complex way. Uh, and it turns out that the key to understanding and modeling these cells is understanding this complexity. So apologies to any biologists in the room, but I'm going to give you a vastly simplified uh, uh, version of how genes interpret genetic information. So cells contain DNA molecules, and a gene is just a stretch of this molecule. Genes are recipes for making other molecules in the cell. And under certain conditions, a gene will be active, uh, and then more molecules will be made. Um, these circular molecules there are proteins, and these are the ones that do the interesting jobs around the cell. Uh, and one of the jobs that a protein might do is to influence the activity of another gene, um, and, so, and so on and so on. So here we have a regulatory interaction um, in that the red gene is regulating the blue gene. Uh, now, if we consider that there are tens of thousands of genes in a cell, uh, there are many of these regulatory interactions happening all at once, and we can model these through networks. And in our networks, the nodes are the genes, and an edge is drawn between a gene that regulates another gene. Um, so these networks are big. They reconfigure themselves dynamically under different conditions. Um, and they are, for the most part, completely unknown to us. So how can we learn more about these networks? Well, given the scale of the problem, experimental solutions really aren't the way to go. Um, but what we can do is we can measure uh, the levels of this intermediate molecule in the cell, which is called mRNA. Uh, so we can actually measure the mRNA levels for many, many genes at once, and we use this as a proxy for the activity of each gene. So here is kind of an overview of what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have some cells. We generate these data sets which tell us how active all the genes are. Um, so here the rows are genes. The values are mRNA concentrations, or, or you could just think of the activity of the gene. Um, the columns I've deliberately left blank, we'll go into that in a moment. Uh, but from these data sets, we can infer these networks. So such data sets have been available to us for a few decades now. And historically, they have uh, encapsulated the activity of a set of predetermined genes uh, in a very small handful of conditions. Um, and in each condition, we're looking at the activity of the gene in a whole population of cells. So more recently, it's actually become possible to measure hundreds or thousands of genes' activity in hundreds or thousands of individual cells. Um, and so this is producing much bigger data sets. Now, these data sets, they're obviously not as big as we see in some fields, but um, for the packages that we use widely in our field, um, it is uh, becoming a bit of a challenge for the existing software. 
However, it does present a, a nice opportunity for more in-depth statistical analysis. Um, so I'm going to tell you how Julia helped us get the most out of these data sets. One of the simplest ways to infer a network from such a data set is to simply take all the possible pairs of genes, um, work out some kind of similarity me uh, metric for that pair of genes, and then just connect up all the most similar ones. To avoid, uh, certain, um, uh, to avoid certain assumptions such as linearity, we often use mutual information from information theory. Um, and that is calculated using the uh, joint probability distribution uh, of the two genes' activity. The problem is they tend to produce, this approach tends to produce uh, networks that look a bit like this, where we've got a small number of genes uh, very heavily connected. And from the knowledge that we do have about these networks, we know this is unrealistic. With single cell data, we realize we could actually use higher order information measures um, because we now have enough information to estimate three-dimensional probability distributions. So we wanted to see if we could develop some kind of algorithm uh, that could improve on the existing uh, mutual information-based algorithms. To do so, we implemented informationmeasures.jl, and here is an overview of it. Uh, there's a certain number of decisions that you make when uh, calculating such measures, uh, how to discretize the data, how to estimate the probability distributions, and of course, which information measure to use. Um, so we included all of these options. We gave it quite a flexible API. We knew we would have to be uh, inferring hundreds of networks from simulated data sets in order to test out our ideas and also to benchmark <coughs> against existing algorithms. Um, so speed was a real, real issue for, you, for us. Uh, we did not want to be waiting hours or even 20 minutes for each network to be inferred. So we compared our package to a very widely used and heavily cited R package uh, for inferring such networks. And you can see that the speed up is quite considerable. Um, these graphs show times for relatively medium data sets. Uh, just for fun, I tried it on a larger data set. Uh, Julia was able to infer a network in a couple of minutes. R uh, possibly took a few hours, but when I tried to replicate this, my laptop just kept crashing, so I put a question mark there. Um, OK, so for reasons that I won't go into right now, uh, the information measure that turned out to be mathematically most appropriate was partial information decomposition, which is presented in this paper here. Uh, basically, what it does is it allows us to, uh, for a system of three variables or three genes, um, uh, distinguish between the information that all three share and the information that's unique to the pair of interest. So we, um, we developed an algorithm based on this method. Um, and I'll spare you the details for now, but it's actually uh, written up in this paper here if you do want to read more. Um, it's currently in review, but it's available on BioArchive. Um, and yeah, it turned out that our algorithm uh, was an improvement over the existing algorithms. Uh, obviously, there's a more quantitative comparison in the paper, but I thought this was a nice visual example um, of networks that we have infer uh, inferred on real uh, data. Um, and it kind of shows the value of using these higher order measures. Um, so our approach is being used uh, to make real biological findings. Uh, the network on the left there um, is from this paper here, and it, uh, uh, we were able to learn a little bit more about developing neurons in the mouse. Um, and the, the key thing is, the, the reason we have any confidence in these networks is because we were able to rigorously test our algorithm, rigorously test the parameters, and um, it was really the speed and the hackability of Julia that allowed us to do this. So, in summary, biological data sets are getting bigger, which is great because we can do more sophisticated analyses, and Julia is really helping uh, uh, us to capital capitalize on this. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody in my group, the Theoretical Systems Biology Group at Imperial. Uh, in particular, the group leader, Michael Stumpf, who is a very vocal advocate of Julia, um, and Dr. Anne Babti, who I've been working with very closely as well. And here are those references. Thanks. <laughs>